My connection with my farm uh, is very important for me because it sort of gives anchorage to many of my uh, observations about what is needed in, in farming and I'll refer to, to that. Uh, which, and the connection now spans over 40 years and it is a fascinating thing to have a relationship with a piece of land over that time and to observe the consequences of your actions on the land and the ecology of the place. So that will be one of my reference points. This uh, program uh, was um, uh, thought about as a, an opportunity to do just exactly what you were speaking about. And, um, and certainly, in general, this, uh, this conference is, is attempting to, to uh, enter into that territory of how we can take very real worldly matters and consider them uh, from a sort of a spiritual point of view. And um, I know that in, in speaking about today's uh, session with you, um, we, we both kind of realized that that may not be so typical of conversations around sustainable agriculture. Uh, no, it's, it's wonderfully untypical, but timely. Because I think the context, the external context of this discussion has changed on, in a number of different ways. And one way in which it needs to change is that discussions of this kind need to be more public. Mm -hmm. Because until now, it's almost been something you didn't talk about. Mm -hmm. your, your work in the world had to be very practical mm -hmm. and reductionist and scientific and evidence-based. Not that any of those things, well, with the exception of reductionism, uh, are wrong. But I think that, in truth, um, many of us who are working in this sphere feel these other connections and these other pulls, and it's right that we should include them in, in a discussion. Although this, the, the inner and outer connection is one that I'm living with and I'm sure will continue to live with for the rest of my life, a more worldly question, which is related, I think, to it, is the question of what is health? Um, because it's so clear that health, in its deepest sense, including well-being and the spiritual dimension, as we've already touched on this morning, um, is, a, is one of the ways in which we can relate to ourselves, but also our environment and our higher purpose, perhaps. And so I want to explore that question, um, from a, first of all, from a historical perspective. Um, some of you will know that it, it, it's 90 years in, I think, three weeks' time, since Rudolf Steiner um, was invited to give a series of lectures in uh, what is now East Germany, uh, was East Germany then, um, uh, on, prompted by some questions from some fairly large-scale estate owners uh, in East Germany who were noticing, this is 1924, uh, a decline in the vitality of their crops. Uh, they went to Rudolf Steiner, who was a, a teacher, but a teacher who had no background in agriculture, which is very interesting. So where did he get all these ideas and knowledge from? And that, I think, is interesting, too, because you could say that, this is something I feel very strongly, that when one is tapping into um, an idea which is relevant, it's almost as if the idea is not one's own. It's born out of perhaps some practical experience one has, or in the case of Rudolf Strano, it obviously wasn't, because he wasn't in agriculture. And yet, when he spoke in the agricultural lectures, the people that were listening to him knew that he was, he was touching on some deep truths. And the, uh, the result of the lectures was the development of what is now called biodynamic farming, which of course is a major aspect of sustainable agriculture globally. And what the farmers noticed uh, was that despite their best efforts, the vitality of their crops and their uh, livestock seemed to be diminishing. So he gave a series of um, lectures in which he suggested that the farmers should undertake certain um, actions to counter this uh, devitalization, which was observed by the, uh, the farmers there. And um, 90 years later, you could say that although the biodynamic movement is, is a, a strong force in the world, uh, it's been overwhelmed um, by the headlong 
um, charge towards um, increasing yields and productivity based on a kind of reductionist approach uh, made possible by the use of fertilizers, uh, which of course uh, developed as a byproduct of the explosives industry, the Harbour Bosch process. And then, because the fertilizers themselves artificially stimulate growth and make the plants more vulnerable to diseases, pests, and weeds, the chemistry industry then came on top of that and uh, treated the symptoms of poor plant nutrition. So even though Rudolf Steiner really came up with a series of uh, precise indications of how to counter this devitalization process, in mainstream agriculture, actually the opposite has taken place. Mm -hmm. And the other person that I would like to refer to who's been a source of inspiration to me is a man called Albert Howard, um, a British scientist knighted for his services to uh, agricultural research, particularly in plant diseases, who was sent out to India, actually now uh, the Hunza Valley, now part of Pakistan, in 1905 uh, on a mission to teach the peasant farmers um, how to adopt more progressive Western methods of food production. And he had the humility to realize that he had nothing to teach them because he observed that their farming methods, which involved the return of uh, wastes in the form of composted residues back to the soil, so they practiced the law of return, resulted in plants that seemed to be healthy, even though the diseases were out there, which of course they always are, mm. uh, the plants seemed to be able to withstand them and stay healthy. And he also, also noticed that the animals that were eating these plants were free of parasites and didn't seem to, seem to suffer from diseases. And finally, the people themselves were vigorous, uh, lived till 120 and were feared fighters. And he made the connection that the health of soil, plant, animal and man is one and indivisible. And this, this is a profoundly interesting um, observation which, upon which the development of what is now being called the organic movement was based. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is certainly my observation on my own farm um, that when the farming is right, health is the consequence. Mm -hmm. So really our quest should be to try to understand what management promotes health which prevails against the pests, diseases and weeds which are, as uh, Howard called them, nature's professors of good husbandry because they reveal to us our management deficiencies. Now this has been the opposite of the direction that agriculture has formed. So it's been artificial stimulation of growth uh, and then suppressing the symptoms of poor management and nutrition artificially through a range of pesticides, fungicides and herbicides in agriculture and then in livestock, antibiotics and other drugs. Mm. So we're really uh, dealing with a, a culture of, of lack of understanding mm. of, of what is positive health. And Howard said, I think I'm more or less quoting Howard, he mm. said, health is a positive state when uh, an organism, uh, a plant, a bacterium and whatever it is, mm. a, a, an animal or a person, mm is in some sort of dynamic state of equilibrium with its environment and is able to withstand uh, pest and disease challenges out of that positive state. And I think he might have added uh, spiritual health as well because I think all these things are connected. Mm -hmm. A couple of things have happened to me in the last uh, few years which have made me, caused me to sort of understand the importance of soil in a different way. And one of them was uh, a remark made by David Wilson, the farm manager at Prince Charles's farm at Highgrove, who said that somebody told him that we should understand uh, that the soil is like the stomach of the plant. And what he meant by that, which I didn't quite get at the time, was that plants don't have a stomach, obviously, but in a way, the soil is their stomach because they spend a significant amount of their metabolic energy exuding uh, sap into the root zone which nourishes a symbiotic community of bacteria and fungi which perform the role of digesting organic matter which the plant can't do on its own upon which the plant depends to get its nutrition. Mm -hmm. So plants nourish themselves through this incredible symbiotic relationship with soil, um, bacteria and fungi. I can relate to the soil through an understanding of my own stomach. It's very, very intimate. Mm. 
-hmm. And that if you think about that, you think about the biology of the ecosystem of a human being as being like a sort of metaphor for our understanding of our relationship with the wider world. And this idea of ecology, which starts with me and then extends to perhaps my garden, if I'm a gardener, or then maybe to the farm, and then the wider ecosystem, including the food ecosystem, of which we are all part, but has now become globalized. If we can understand the small, then we can already have the capacity to understand the large. And now I'm going around my farm in a completely new way because, as I said, I've got 40 years of experience of farming, yeah. and I can see that the yields on our farm are growing and that sort of thing. But I can now see that if I, I see myself as a steward of the biology of the soil on my farm, I have the capacity to help improve its state of vitality and nutrition by nourishing it with composted animal manures or maybe fresh animal manures, by structuring it, by making sure I don't compact it with machinery at the wrong time, and then by grazing it holistically. I'm starting to adopt the uh, savoury, holistic, mob grazing, whatever you want to call it, management scheme system with my cows this year. I reckon I can take my productivity to another level on the farm, even though the yields have been going up steadily since we've been there. And this relates to a question which um, I think Wendell was asked last night about, you know, the, they were both asked actually about, you know, how do they see their own, how do they describe it? They said they, their holdings were slightly marginal or something mm -hmm. like Well, uh, my farm's relatively marginal. It's uh, 780 feet up to on a Welsh hill with a lot of rain. But I think the exciting thing, this is you know, my insight from farming all those years, is that a farmer is like a manager of an ecosystem. And it's not that we can do things which are outside the laws of nature, which in a way will always prevail, as Wendell was saying last night. But if we really have good insights into how this, these laws work in the ecology of the small, then we can play a role in increasing our capacity to nourish ourselves and the, the planet's population and keep those systems in harmony with nature. So that's kind of, that's the, that's the framing for what I'm thinking about. And just one more thing, antibiotics. Uh, I work with a colleague called Richard Young, who's one of the world's leading experts in the misuse of antibiotics in um, livestock systems. And we now, I don't know if it's been in the news here, but in the UK in the last week, there's been the news that we're on the threshold of a post-antibiotics era mm -hmm. where we, we may not have be able to use them to save life uh, and to protect from secondary infection after operations. And I think I can say I owe my life at least twice to the use of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. um, and 80% of all the antibiotics used in the US are used in livestock systems, mm -hmm. which is completely interesting. And we've tried to avoid routine use on our farm. But interestingly, because we were closed down with bovine TB mm -hmm. on our, in our herd, mm -hmm. we had to buy some cows in. And the cows that we bought in came from a farm where antibiotics were used. Mm -hmm. And we have a regular milk uh, testing thing for our cows. And last month, we have like a lead table of the somatic cell counts, which is the degree of... Um, uh, potential subclinical mastitis, which is the main disease of the udder. And you have a printout of the highest cell counts and the lowest counts, the highest being bad, lowest being good. And the, of the top 12 cows in our herd, uh, in last month's printout, 10 of them were bought in cows. And I think what's going on there, this is just a hypothesis, is that when you are involved with treating yourself with antibiotics, or in the case of dairy herds, these cows, they have a suppressive effect on the immune system with all sorts of secondary consequences which may last for years. They interfere with the digestion because they wipe out all the beneficial bacteria. And so these cows in their udders were showing that even a year after we bought them. Hmm. So, I mean, those are the sort of interesting insights that you get from being a practitioner. So I, I, I'll pause there.